Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Miller, and I'm the director of the Fertility Center of the Carolinas. I'm going to talk today about the evaluation and treatment of secondary amenorrhea. Normal menstrual function depends on the interaction of two systems, the endocrine, endocrine system and the urogenital tract. Normally, there's a feedback loop between the brain, in particular the area called the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the ovaries. The brain sends out pulses of GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Depending on the, the frequency and amplitude of the pulses, the pituitary gland then sends out pulses of its own hormones, luteinizing hormone and follicle-stimulating hormone. And then the ovaries basically do as they're told and make uh, estrogen, among other things, that feeds back to the central nervous system and completes the feedback loop. The urogenital tract, in turn, responds to changes in fluctuating levels of estrogen and progesterone creates a nice lush thick lining as estrogen levels rise towards mid-cycle and then at the time of ovulation when progesterone levels rise progesterone stabilizes that thickened lining if there's an implanting fertilized egg tumbling down the tube into the uterus um, that embryo will implant at about six days post ovulation if there is no implanting fertilized egg both estrogen progesterone levels fall and women have periods we define secondary amenorrhea as the absence of menses in women who previously have menstruated, but we for further qualify that by saying it usually has to be for uh, greater than three cycles uh, or uh, greater than six months. This just prevents people from being tagged prematurely when they may not actually have uh, amenorrhea. We also then subdivide the causes of the secondary, secondary amenorrhea into uh, low, normal, and uh, high FSH groups. And most of the folks we see are going to be in that normal category. Uh, the most uh, easily distinguishable are those in this, the high FSH group. And these are the uh, young women who may have uh, premature ovarian failure, or what's now more correctly called ovarian insufficiency. Mm -hmm. These people have high FSH because of uh, gonadal failure. They have uh, uh, very few or, or no eggs left and, um, again, are very easily distinguished from the others uh, from a single blood test. I should point out, though, that within this category, uh, there's a much higher rate of abnormal karyotype. Uh, the most common karyotype seen still is 46XX, However, uh, quite often there'll be a small portion of one of the X chromosomes uh, missing, or there may be mosaicism uh, with uh, absence of one of the X chromosomes in some cells. In other cases, there can even be a, a portion of a Y chromosome. Current recommendation is that for women who have premature ovarian failure uh, at the age of 30 or younger, that they uh, undergo karyotyping for just this reason. Amongst the low FSH group, uh, these are the women typically with hypothalamic dysfunction. Uh, these people may be uh, performance artists, uh, athletes, uh, women with uh, eating disorders. And uh, curiously, what we see here is that um, oftentimes FSH within the normal range, but it's low normal. Uh, what we see more commonly is that LH is very low. And the reason why you may see a, a normal FSH with a very low LH is that uh, FSH is a much longer half-life than LH. Both are stimulated by GnRH secretion, but if there are uh, slow, infrequent pulses of GnRH, um, LH, which has only about a 20-minute half-life, will uh, show up in serum at very low levels, while FSH, which has about a four-hour half-life, will continue to be uh, with, well within the normal range. These people are sometimes uh, very difficult to uh, diagnose, as they, they may not uh, readily uh, report uh, their uh, behaviors that may be contributing to their um, hypothalamic dysfunction. So it's very carefully you take uh, an excellent history. Other folks in this low gonadotropin category may have uh, elevated levels of prolactin, hyperprolactinemia. Prolactin, which is uh, secreted from the anterior pituitary, is an important for normal uh, lactation, but it is not uncommon for prolactin levels to be elevated outside of pregnancy. Uh, when prolactin... Uh, levels go up, we typically see gonadotropin levels go down, and this can lead to menstrual irregularities and amenorrhea. Among the normal FSH group, um, the most common cause is polycystic ovary syndrome. Polycystic ovary syndrome 
is characterized by um, oligo or anovulation, uh, clinical evidence of uh, hyperandrogenism or biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Uh, in order to be diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome, you have to have two out of these three criteria. And uh, I'll point out that these criteria are commonly called the Rotterdam criteria after an international conference held in Rotterdam back in 2003. Uh, the more classic Stein-Leventhal syndrome that was described many years ago uh, usually includes simply obesity, hirsutism, and amenorrhea. Uh, here in the United States, we still seem to think of uh, polycystic ovary syndrome as uh, being more like the classic Stein-Leventhal syndrome. However, in most parts of the world, the criteria are much looser uh, because they follow the Rotterdam uh, uh, consensus. In any case, women with polycystic ovary syndrome um, uh, also have uh, associated metabolic problems. They quite often have uh, hyperinsulinemia. Um, insulin from the pancreas, pancreas helps to absorb uh, sugar for fuel, but uh, these women tend to be insulin resistant, so the high insulin in turn uh, stimulates the ovaries to make more testosterone. Uh, insulin also uh, leads the liver to uh, decrease production of sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. SHBG is the main circulating protein to which testosterone sticks. So in effect, what insulin does is it stimulates uh, thecal cells to make more testosterone and then makes more of that testosterone bioavailable by decreasing the liver's production of SHBG. That's one reason why these women have problems with uh, hirsutism. We also see, though, that they have problems with, uh, if not frank diabetes, uh, much higher risk for diabetes later in life, um, higher risks for gestational diabetes, higher risks for hyperlipidemia. Uh, some of the clues that we look for in addition to a hirsutism are things uh, like acanthosis nigricans. Acanthosis is a uh, darkening and uh, hyperpigmentation of the skin. Usually it skin creases in the axillary areas or at the base of the neck. The skin can be somewhat uh, velvety in texture. Patients often uh, report scrubbing to try and clean their, uh, quote, dirty skin, end quote, uh, and it never seems to come clean. This is uh, not something that will uh, rub off. The other thing that you can notice on exam is that they tend to have more of a um, male-type fat distribution. You know, most uh, women have more of what we would call a gynecoid uh, fat distribution. So, you know, women are shaped like pears. That's a very bad-looking pear. Whereas uh, men, when they, they get uh, heavy, tend to have more of an apple shape. This apple shape, it goes along with increased abdominal obesity, which in turn leads to increased insulin resistance. And we can see this also in our polycystic ovary patients. Uh, important to educate women with PCOS because they are at much higher risk for uh, uh, other comorbidities later on in life. The other group that we see in this normal category are um, uh, folks with uh, hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism uh, uh, is one of the more unique uh, disorders in uh, the endocrine world because it can be associated with uh, uh, menorrhagia, large amounts of bleeding, but also can be associated with amenorrhea. Um, uh, hypothyroidism is uh, best screened for simply by looking at a TSH, although there are a minority of cases where there'll be a secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism where people will have normal TSH in the face of uh, otherwise low thyroid hormone output. The other uh, group that we see in this category with normal gonadotropins are folks with uh, problems with the genital tract. And it's, there aren't a lot of things that can cause uh, problems with genital tract obstruction um, or poor endometrial proliferation um, in the folks who have previously menstruated. But far and away, the most common thing we see is something called uh, Asherman syndrome. Asherman syndrome is uh, essentially scarring of the endometrial cavity with what are called synechiae. Synechiae usually form uh, in the presence of some type of infection or inflammation. The most common scenario we see leading to this syndrome are women who have had a second trimester miscarriage. They then go on to have an induced delivery they may have re retention of the placenta or a small piece of placenta that gets infected. That then leads to uh, inflammation and, and scarring of the endometrial cavity.
So these are the main causes of, um, of uh, secondary amenorrhea. There are some others. I think if you uh, keep these in mind that I've already mentioned, uh, you should be in uh, good shape for any future uh, assessment of patients. Um, in terms of laboratory evaluation, usually first line evaluation is uh, TSH, uh, prolactin, and of course HCG. Never forget that the most common cause for uh, secondary amenorrhea in a reproductive age woman is pregnancy. Um, estrogen or estradiol uh, can be helpful, not always, uh, just as um, FSH uh, with or without LH uh, can also be helpful. If you suspect polycystic ovary syndrome, it's probably also worth looking at a testosterone as well as um, a hormone called dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate. It's a uh, weak androgen from the adrenal glands, but it's often elevated and can lead to uh, hirsutism in women with PCOS. Uh, once you've done your laboratory assessment, you can already weed out then those that have uh, gonadal failure from that group. They're going to have very high FSH levels. Uh, one of the things that quite often we do at this point is to give what's called a progestin challenge. We can give something like medroxyprogesterone acetate, uh, which is Provera, 10 milligrams for uh, 10 days. If they've had any type of endometrial uh, exposure to estrogen, they've had proliferation, and this should stabilize that endometrium just as would happen in a normal luteal phase. When the progestin stops, they should shed that lining. So that's a good test to see whether they are hypoestrogenic or euestrogenic. The only time this doesn't work is if you have Asherman syndrome. So if you give someone a progestin challenge and they don't withdraw, the next step is to then give estrogen plus progesterone. So uh, a typical regimen would be to give, uh, for instance, a 0 0.1 milligram uh, estradiol patch uh, for three weeks alone, uh, and then uh, give one week of uh, Provera plus the patch. That, that should be enough estrogen to cause endometrial proliferation. If they fail to have a withdrawal bleed in this case, then you do have to suspect there's some type of um, genital tract uh, abnormality. In some cases, it may not be Asherman syndrome. It could be something like cervical stenosis. In cases where um, there may be a problem with prolactin, and I did forget to mention that on my previous slide, uh, important for you to understand that there are physiologic reasons for elevations in prolactin, uh, unrelated to any type of um, adenoma formation. Uh, things like uh, medications, uh, phenothiazine drugs, for instance, are very notorious for increasing uh, prolactin. Uh, but also things like uh, nipple stimulation, intercourse, these can all uh, transiently increase prolactin. But when you see that the prolactin level is elevated, usually uh, you repeat it. Uh, a week or so later to make sure it's a true elevation. If it's elevated on, on more than one occasion, uh, we usually then do um, some type of pituitary imaging. The most common is to do an MRI looking for any type of pituitary adenoma. An adenoma is, is simply uh, overgrowth of normal uh, lactotrophs, prolactin-producing cells. It is not a uh, malignancy and is usually easily treated with some type of uh, dopamine agonist. So that's the basic evaluation for uh, anyone with uh, uh, secondary amenorrhea. I hope that you've uh, learned something today and uh, encourage you to read more on this topic. Thank you.